Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. It's good to see you. My name is Caleb. I'm glad you're here. On this channel, we talk about books, and today we're talking about Housekeeping, or Huh, for short, by Marilyn Robinson. Huh was published in 1980 by Bantam Books, and my copy has 219 pages. An interesting factoid about Huh is that it is one of the three books prescribed to every Harvard undergraduate, regardless of major. So when you go to Harvard one day, whether you're pre-law or pre-med or a literature major, you are going to have to read uh, Lolita by Nabokov and To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf and Housekeeping by Marilyn Robinson. And I was sitting and thinking, what unites those three texts at a structural level? What makes them similar? And the answer is, uh, they're all just good books. I think the faculty sat down and said, hey kids, these are three good books, you all have to read them, and that's all that happened. Beyond the Harvard undergraduate fact, however, I think the more compelling thing about Marilyn Robinson is that she is the self-consciously Christian author who is most respected by contemporary secular outlets. 92nd Street Y, The New Yorker, Harper's Esquire, a lot of literary outlets say she is someone who makes faith look compelling, more so than any other Christian writer or self-consciously Christian writer writing today. And here's the secret. Here is why I think non-believers read her and say faith is alluring, if not maybe compelling. Because in her book, she does not come across as Peter preaching at Pentecost, but as Job arguing with God or Jacob wrestling with God. When you read a Marilyn Robinson book, Housekeeping or Gilead or Lila or What Are We Doing Here? You are seeing, you're putting your nose up against the glass and looking in at someone else on their prayer mat. You're looking, out, you're looking in at someone who takes their faith seriously and is wrestling with God in prayer and thinking things through, and how do I apply the love of God expressed on the cross for me in my life? And watching someone else do that, while they're not trying to sell me anything, they're not trying to convert me, they're not trying to tell me I'm wrong, I'm just watching them take their faith seriously, that in itself is compelling. Now, I'm going to summarize the plot of the novel very quickly, so spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. Then I'm going to talk about the most prominent motif in the novel, which is death by means of drowning. And then I want to talk about a few of these ideas that I see her wrestling with in the novel, whether or not she comes to a tidy conclusion in her own heart. I just want to talk about what those ideas are. So, ready or not, here we go. The story is not told from an omniscient third-person perspective. Rather, it's narrated by Ruth, or Ruthie, the main character. It's about Ruthie growing up her childhood until a fateful night when she runs away from home to become homeless. Ruthie is now in her early 30s about looking back on her childhood until that night when she ran away from home. But as Ruthie is narrating her childhood, she doesn't start with herself. She jumps back, actually, to the story of her grandfather, Edmund. And I don't think analyzing character names always yields much fruit when analyzing literature, but in this case, I think Marilyn Robinson chose a lot of the names on purpose. For example, the book starts with Call Me Ruthie or Call Me Ruth, which is an obvious allusion to Moby Dick, Call Me Ishmael. Ishmael is a Gentile, just like Ruth is a Gentile. So right off the bat, Marilyn Robinson, says, Marilyn Robinson is signaling that the names she chooses are not insignificant. And Edmund, the grandfather, the name Edmund means wealthy protector or strong protector, as you may know. And archetypally, Edmund does fill that role in the story. So anyways, Ruth's grandfather, Edmund, he was raised in Illinois, but when he was a young man, he moved to Fingerbone, Idaho. He took one train out west to Fingerbone, Idaho. And Fingerbone is a fictional town that is based structurally off of many real towns in Idaho that Marilyn Robinson would have seen growing up. These are small towns that aren't quite in valleys, but they're surrounded by mountains and hills. And there are a lot of lakes and rivers. There's a lot of water kind of encroaching on the small towns. And there are gray overcast skies. And there are long rickety wooden railroads that run in and out of town. These really long straight railroads are a hallmark of this part of Idaho. And there's one in the fictional town of Fingerbone. Anyways, after Edmund settles down in Fingerbone, he ends up marrying a girl he meets named Sylvia. Sylvia is a name which means dark forest or green forest. And they have three daughters, Molly, Helen, and Sylvie. Now, one night, as Edmund is coming home from work, the train he's on slips off 
the rickety wooden railroad and is swallowed up by a lake. And the description of this scene, the description of everyone on the train drowning, is one of the most lurid death scenes I've ever read. It really sticks in your brain when you read it. I've heard a similar report from other people who've also read Housekeeping, that that same scene of people drowning to death in the train sticks out because it's so it's such a calm description of something so intense. It's something so unexpected and so starkly written, you don't forget it. And so the train is swallowed up and the ripples kind of go out. They hit the edge of the lake and that's it. And night settles in and no one knows the better until the next morning when everyone realizes the train didn't show up. So they send out some divers. They can kind of make out the train at the bottom of the lake, but it's hopeless. Everyone's dead. And so the three girls and Edmund's widow, Sylvia, they continue on. They make meals and they make cookies and they eat together and they go to church and they finish high school. And it's uh, quiet and calm on the outside, but it's really a sad house for all four of these women. It reminds me of what C.S. Lewis says in A Grief Observed, that death is sometimes like the sky. It hangs over everything. You can never see it, but it's always there. That's what the death of Edmund feels like in the house as the girls grow up. And then Molly, the oldest daughter, she becomes a missionary. Now, this is really interesting. Molly is described as such an unattractive missionary. The way she talks about missions is frankly colonial. Uh, she doesn't want to just bring people Christ. She wants to bring them her culture and wrestle them down and make them into Americans, really. She calls the people that she goes to savages. And I, I just don't know why Marilyn Robinson would include this character Molly. She says these unattractive things, leaves, and that's it. Other than, this is my theory, suggestion, Marilyn Robinson is intentionally writing a foil against which she can present her own form of evangelism. It's as if Marilyn Robinson is saying, when I talk about Christianity, which she self-consciously does, she's not hiding the fact that she's a Christian, but when I talk about Christianity, it is not like what Molly is trying to do. I don't know why you would write such an unattractive character for one scene other than to be a foil for yourself, but that's just a guess. The second daughter then, Helen, moves to Seattle, and marries a man named Reginald Stone. And he is as cold as his name suggests. Reginald Stone is a cold man, and they have two kids. Ruth, Ruthie is the narrator of this story, and Lucille, Ruthie is the oldest daughter. Then the third daughter, Sylvie, she moves west and marries a man named Mr. Fisher. And we never learn Mr. Fisher's first name, and the absence of his first name parallels his absence in the story because he abandons Sylvie. He goes off and sleeps with other women and leaves, and then Sylvie falls into a life of near homelessness, what we might call transience. She stays with friends, sleeps on couches, scrounges up enough money to stay in cheap motels, sleeps in train stations, sleeps on trains, and is, is basically homeless. We then jump back to Helen and Reginald Stone's marriage, which is falling apart, he spends more time away. And so Helen takes the two girls, Ruthie and Lucille, back to Fingerbone to be with the grandmother. And Helen then drives her car into the lake, which her father died in. She commits suicide. And it's the same type of description where it's really stark and intense out of nowhere. There are ripples from where the car enters the lake. Those ripples hit the edge of the lake and that's it. No one sees her or the car again. Then Sylvia, the grandmother, dies. So now there are these two little girls. They're like five and seven at the time, Ruthie and Lucille. Their mother has committed suicide. Their grandmother has died. And there's a cycle of potential caregivers. Some aunts come in, some people from the town, but they can't really find anyone to take care of these little girls. So Sylvie shows up, the nearly homeless aunt. And at this point, Sylvie is not all mentally there. Whether she was never mentally there or being homeless took some of her mental awareness away, she's clearly not fully stable, but she's a living adult. So she becomes the caregiver of Ruthie and Lucille. Now, the story thus far has been about 80 pages, and the next 80, 100 pages of the novel are about chaos slowly encroaching upon these three women. Their lives are slowly deteriorating. The girls fall behind in school. They are ostracized socially. It's hard for them to make friends. Their physical clothing becomes tattered. There's a flood. There's a lot of floods in Fingerpone randomly, unpredictably. The lake water will rise and it will sometimes destroy homes. In this case, it rises and just takes things out of the house as if the waters which killed Edmund and Ruth's mother are also destroying the house. The waters are just taking things out of the house and the house never gets put back together. And so just event after event, scene after scene, chaos slowly creeps creeps in and takes over these girls' lives until the town kind of says, 
we can't let this happen. Why did we let a homeless woman take care of two little girls? And Lucille, the younger daughter, says, uh, yeah, I'm with the town. I want to leave. She wants to go to college and be a journal. I forgot what she wants to major in, but she wants to have a career and she wants to have social ties and go to church. So she moves out and stays with a friend. Then the town says, you know what? We're not going to give you a choice. We are going to take Ruthie away. Uh, Lucy, uh, or I mean, um, Sylvie, you were nice for stepping in, but you're a homeless woman. You can't raise a daughter. So the town is going to come and take Ruthie away. But the night before they show up is the night where Ruthie and Sylvie decide to set fire to the farmhouse. They burn the whole orchard down and they run away by walking across that rickety wooden railroad, the same one that Edmund slipped off of in the beginning of the novel. And they leave and uh, enter a life of homelessness. Now, Sylvie and Ruthie are basically homeless. Society doesn't see them. They sometimes are waitresses. They sometimes get small jobs here and there, scrounge up enough money to sleep somewhere for the night. But um, they're basically forgotten. And that's the end of the novel. There are many motifs thoughtfully woven throughout the novel. But the one I want to talk about is the most obvious, but the most punchy which is that death is represented by the lake, or drowning and the lake go together. And Marilyn Robinson chose this for two reasons, I think. One is because death takes people randomly. You can't predict when chaos will strike your life. And in the novel, you can't predict when water will destroy something. So life could be great. You could have a new wife and three daughters and a great job, and then one day it rains too much and your train slips off the tracks and you're swallowed up by the lake. The randomness of water taking people in this novel mirrors or represents the randomness of death and chaos in real life. But then secondly, and more intensely, much more intensely, is that in the novel there are a number of scenes where at the bottom of the lake we know there's a train full of dead people. There's Helen who has committed suicide by driving her car into the lake. There are other people who have accidentally fallen into the lake. There are all of the possessions of the town that have been swallowed up by the lake. But then on top of the lake, it's frozen over and families are ice skating. People just go on with their life. And then it's like these people are ice skating and the camera pans down and you see all of the death and the destruction and the skeletons. It's so dark, not just because there's people skating on top of dead people, but because it represents being unseen. What makes suffering infinitely worse is when you aren't only suffering intensely, but you feel that your intense suffering is completely unnoticed by reality. It's not that people are ignoring you on purpose to be cruel. It's that the world doesn't even notice you enough to purposefully ignore you. The world just goes on and you're at the bottom of a lake. That type of intense suffering, compounded by being unseen, is represented so clearly by the lake. It's, it's the best metaphor for death I think there could be. Now I want to talk about those few theological ideas that Marilyn Robinson is wrestling with in the novel. Not that she's preaching, but that she herself is working through in these pages. The first is the idea of housekeeping. And this is not a new or extravagant idea. The idea is simply that someone's internal state of being will affect the physical world around them. If someone's soul is in tatters, their clothes will be in tatters. If someone's soul is orderly and flourishing, the physical world around them will begin to be orderly and flourishing. If you walk around my house and you look at the way I keep house, you could tell a lot about my actual soul. And so this idea, this organic connection between the way someone presents themselves, the way someone takes care of the physical world around them, and what's happening inside of them, that's a common idea. What then becomes theological is she says, okay, if the way someone keeps house is tied to the soul of the housekeeper, then what must the quality of God of God's soul be like if we look at the way he keeps house? Look at the universe. The universe is God's house. Look at the stars and the mountains and the lakes and the trees. This is all God's house. This can tell us about the quality of God's soul. In the same way, if you look at my house, you can kind of learn a little bit about the quality of my soul. And so there are a lot of passages where there's drama going on, there's a conversation, but then Marilyn Robinson will zoom out and look at the stars and look at the stars reflected on the lake and look at the leaves blowing in the wind and look at the dark green forests around Fingerbone and reflect on if the house over there that's perfectly ordered represents the clean, calm, righteous state of the people inside that house, then what must all of these beautiful trees and mountains and lakes say about the quality of the soul of the housekeeper of the universe? It's not quite a cosmological or teleological argument. She's not saying there is a creation, therefore there must be a creator, there is a design, therefore there must be a designer. It's a more poetic point. It's, a, it's saying, what is the heart of God like if he made all of this stuff? In the same way you can tell about the heart of an artist from their paintings or their poems. You can tell about the heart of God by looking at the sky. 
The second theological point that she wrestles with is the doctrine of resurrection. And it's almost as if she is talking herself into believing in to the strongest version of the Christian doctrine of resurrection, which is almost too good to believe in. The, the weakest version of the Christian doctrine of resurrection is that Jesus didn't literally rise from the dead, but wherever people live out his ethics, he is resurrected amongst us. So in older liberal churches, they would say, the corpse of Jesus stayed in the tomb, obviously. We know people don't get resurrected after crucifixion. But when the disciples decided to love their neighbors as themselves and love their enemies, then it was as if Jesus was resurrected amongst them. And the stronger version of the doctrine of resurrection is, um, no, Jesus literally rose from the dead. He was crucified, put in a tomb, and then he walked out of the tomb. But the strongest version of the doctrine of resurrection says that when Jesus rose from the dead, All of the suffering he endured on the cross became worth it. It was tied up into something greater. It became worth it for him to suffer because it saved us. And likewise, all suffering will be resurrected. That doesn't mean everyone will be saved, but there won't be one ounce of wasted pain. There's no gratuitous suffering at all in the universe, just like there was no gratuitous suffering at all on the cross. The resurrection of Jesus is a type of the resurrection of the universe. And just as all of the suffering of Jesus was used, all of the suffering in the whole universe will be used. And Marilyn Robinson kind of gets herself to believe this grand story of resurrection by, again, looking at the theme of housekeeping. Look at the way God keeps house. Look at the way God keeps house. We can tell his character is good. He's not going to waste anything. Can I, can I really believe that God is not going to waste any suffering? I think I can. I think I can. That's the tone of the novel. She's not trying to get you to believe in the resurrection. She's just saying, I think I really can believe nothing will be wasted. This then also explains the shift that takes place in the middle of the novel. And it is a little bit of a whiplash shift. The beginning of the novel is talking about physical death, actual death, where people slide into lakes or commit suicide in lakes and die. But then the novel starts talking about a form of death, which isn't physical death, but it's homelessness. The novel kind of shifts themes from physical death to homelessness, which does, it feels like, a where, why, what are we talking about? I thought we were talking about death for a while, and now we're talking about homelessness. But... If you talk about this strong doctrine of resurrection, if you see that as one of the themes Marilyn Robinson is wrestling with, then homelessness makes perfect sense as a second topic for the novel. Because she isn't just saying everyone's death will matter, but the type of death where society forgets you. You're unseen. All of culture just moves past you as you sit on a a street, as you sleep outside on a street all night, and everyone else moves on and doesn't look at you. That type of suffering, the suffering of the homeless, will also be resurrected and will matter when Jesus returns. The most famous line in the novel is, what are all these loose ends for if not to be finally knit up together into something beautiful in the end? What are all these loose ends for if not to be finally knit up together into something beautiful in the end? That's not something Marilyn Robinson is preaching to you. It's something she's preaching to herself Look at the way God keeps house. I don't think he will let any suffering go to waste. Not only physical suffering, but even the type of suffering we call homelessness. That's what I think housekeeping is about. If you think this book, if you think this summary sounds interesting, even though I did spoil the plot by telling you the whole plot, I don't think the contents are really spoilable. You will still find this deep and piercing, even if you know the events that are going to happen. So I love this book. Um, I think you should read it along with Lolita and to the lighthouse, um, I guess I'm saying I agree with Harvard faculty. So if you like this video, please give it a like and a sub. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.